Howdy. My name is Jason Pavic, and this is my thesis on interactive UI design for virtual reality. My scene artifact is built around three main masteries of diegetic user interface, virtual reality, and interactables, and mainly the generator hero mechanism. The artifact of my thesis is a near future space vessel where the user can freely move about the room and interact with various components in virtual reality. The scene was made in Unreal Engine 4.22 with the intention of being played in virtual reality. Now the first area of mastery, diegetic user interface, the user primarily interacts with the scene via an arm mounted data pad and they use various in-world UI elements to also interact with the scene. For virtual reality, I focused on the Oculus Rift S to enhance immersion via a headset and motion controllers. My scene was built in a way in Unreal to where it should be hardware agnostic, meaning it should be able to work with other headsets. However, it has only been tested with the Oculus Rift S, so quality performance is not guaranteed for other kinds of headsets. VR requires a very different kind of optimization and it's important to keep a high frame rate or you'll make people sick. Now my third area of mastery is interactables and mainly the, the generator, which is a hero object. It was especially important in this mastery to focus on making my interactions utilize the tools provided by virtual reality and having diegetic UI elements. In a diegetic user interface, the UI elements exist inside a world where both the character and the player see the elements in the same way, versus in a non-diegetic UI in traditional gaming, UI elements are typically posted to the screen in fixed positions, such as a health bar or the mini-map in the Halo picture in the top right. However, in Halo, they have both non-diegetic and diegetic elements such as on the assault rifle, you can see the ammo counter clearly written there to where Master Chief or any of the Marines would be able to see their ammo UI widget. But also in the top corner, you have the non-diegetic icons with the ammo count. In most games, you're gonna to wanna to pick one way or another. It really depends on the project. In virtual reality, typically, you're gonna to wanna to go with diegetic UI over non-diegetic UI. And the main reasoning behind this is typically VR is in first person perspective to where you are the player and you are the player character in the character's world. You're seeing through their eyes and it only makes sense that the, the user interface exists in a way that they would see it. There is more than one way to do a diegetic user interface. A non-traditional way that I enjoy is how Splinter Cell Conviction is a third person action shooter game where they use diegetic elements in a way to where they project Sam Fisher's thoughts and memories onto walls, such as text that navigates the player. And these are thoughts that Sam Fisher is currently thinking and it helps progress the story without making you go through menus and read about what's happening. For my data pad, I referenced existing virtual reality data pads that were similar. On the top left image, you have Lone Echo's pad, which is similar in shape to an iPad. This one is focused mostly on visuals where it has a lot of just flashy data and uh, colorful graphics. And while this one looks nice, um, it's not very functional in terms of trying to poke every little button on this would be very difficult with VR hands. Meanwhile, on the bottom image, you have Rec Room, which has the opposite approach to where they strip away any visual elements that aren't necessary. And everything here is scaled up and easy to function with. And for my data pad, I wanted to find a happy medium to where everything would retain its function and be large and easy to read, easy to press buttons. But I also wanted to have some visual flair, but not enough to become distracting. And I wanted it to be clear with what parts of this are interactive, what parts of this are visual, and to remove any unnecessary clutter and redundancies. There are special considerations to take in place when designing a user interface for virtual reality. While VR does require a high pixel count of 
in my case, 2560 by 1440p, it's actually lower resolution in the headset than typical games would appear. For this reason, it's important to use larger than normal text of very legible typefaces and avoid thin lines and thin text whenever possible. For menus, you do not have the precision that you would normally have with a mouse, and you need to have large buttons that are appropriately spaced because VR fingers tend to be a little more clunky than our typical human fingers, and you want to be able to press the correct button without pressing every button, and you want it to be comfortable, so you want to design large, and you want to optimize and remove any features that may be getting in the way. As mentioned earlier, for virtual reality, I am using the Oculus Rift S headset and motion controllers. This is currently the flagship headset for Oculus, and it came out in May 2019 and is still considered a high-end VR headset. The Oculus Rift S runs a resolution of 2560 by 1440p at a maximum frame rate of 80 frames per second. For virtual reality, it is recommended to keep a stable frame rate above 70 frames per second, or users may experience motion sickness. For virtual reality, it is also pleasing to have enough space to stand and move your arms in all directions without clipping through walls and ceilings. So you want to consider people of different heights and different sizes, different arm spans, and it's important to have enough resolution in terms of both polygons and pixels to be able to hold an object all the way up to your face, but then also still look good when it's far enough away. Stereoscopic depth is both a plus and minus in virtual reality. As a plus, things look more realistic in terms of things having actual perceivable depth, but it's also a minus in terms of it's easier for something to look fake when you have stereoscopic depth, and it also affects things like normal maps and how they're perceived by the player, which will be covered later. For my generator interactive object, I was mostly inspired by the robot repair section of Valve's The Lab. For me, this was the first VR demo that truly showed off what made VR special and what could be done in this sort of game that couldn't be done in traditional game design. This sort of machine symbolizes full-on immersion and the ability to interact with one's own hands as opposed to just clicking a mouse or a controller. However, the robot repair section in the lab has some very noticeable flaws. Mainly, this is designed to be complex, complicated, confusing, the player fails 100% of the time by design. It's a problem that intentionally has no solution because the whole demo is for you to fail. For mine, I wanted to go kind of the opposite way where I want it to be functional and I wanted it to make sense for the user. I didn't want them to be confused or lost. I wanted my UI and my room design to be in a way to where everything related back to the generator and everything made sense when the player took a second to look at, look at it and they could actually solve the problems presented in the three sections of the generator. And as far as interactions in VR goes, the player's hands are their main tools and you want to utilize the hands. Using just thumbsticks and buttons in VR is not full immersion. I think Valve's Half-Life Alex, although it's a recent game, I think some of what they do is the best VR design around because your hands are your tools in that game. And even using something like the health machine requires you to pick up this uh, bug-like object in a cylinder, plug it in, and then you put your actual hand down on a pad and it stitches health into your fingers versus just pressing X to heal. Before I go further along into my scene and explain the systems and how and why everything works the way it does, I would like to give you a full demo of my scene and explain things from within a VR headset. The first thing you might notice inside my thesis scene is that you are in virtual reality. 
and you have full freedom to turn around in any direction. This is not a forced directional virtual reality experience. This is a omnidirectional full freedom movement. Um, in this in this scene, you have the ability to move your head, and you have two hands, and both hands can grab. And then one thing you'll notice is you have this button on your left arm, and this menu button pulls up what we call the data pad. And the data pad is the main way you'll interact with the user interface of the scene. And the user interface is tied to all of the actual objects in the scene, as we will demonstrate in a few moments. Now, pressing the button again hides it. So let's pull it up. And the first thing you're going to notice when reading from left to right is this top panel that says Generator Access Lock Engaged. You might not know what that means immediately, but you'll notice these icons there. But looking around the room, you notice very similar three icons and the lock. And you'll say, oh, OK, this must be the generator. And lock engaged. So that's the lock, and it's highlighted. So I'm going to instinctually want to poke one of these other ones. And when I poke it there, it highlights there. When I poke the middle one, the middle one lights up. And when I poke that, that lights up. And also, this little handle UI here is changing too. And I can relock it by pressing that. Another thing you might try is, in the scene, you might poke it. And this is updating too. And poking in one place updates everywhere in real time. And when I say everywhere, I also mean this little panel on the right side, the monitor over here, and the window over here all update in real time. And all right, so now that the first one's selected, it says inner core unlocked. And I don't entirely know what all that means yet, but I'm going to keep looking down the list. I see a suit battery and a pod battery, and it's slowly ticking down over time. This is a uh, in an actual situation in a space station, your battery is a very important part of your life support because it controls your oxygen and your ability to interact with things. In this scene, it's entirely a variable, but it, if I was to extend the scene into a greater project, this variable is ready to go to tie to other resources and can be used in many game scenarios and puzzle scenarios. Anyways, going down the list, I see Atom Exhausted and an icon. Replace the exhausted Atom in the generator core with a fresh Atom. First time you read that, it's not going to make any sense. You don't know what that means. But you look at that icon there, and you look around the room, and you see this thing that's spinning. And it's like, that kind of looks like it, but that one's green. But replace the exhausted Atom in the generator core with fresh Atom. Inner core unlocked from the generator access. This is probably where I need to go. But how do I open this? I don't see a traditional handle anywhere. But I do see this question mark. So what happens when I poke it? Grab and pull here to open the generator. OK, that's good to know. I pull that open. And on the inside, I see the red exhausted atom that my data pad has told me about. And so when I reach in here and grab it, it sticks to my hand and says, dying atom dissipation in five seconds and counts down. And it implodes itself within my grasp. And now there's nothing in here. And if I close it, it doesn't come back. It's still gone. But I know there's this green one that looks very much like that red one we had earlier. And so when I press this button, fresh atoms belong in the generator core. Replace the exhausted atom in the generator core with fresh atom. OK, great. So maybe I can just grab this. And I, if I want to get a better look at it, it has zero gravity and floats around. I can pull the tool tip up again if I need it. But I already know what I'm doing. So my instinct is to put this one where the old one was. And so I'm going to try to do that. And it snaps into place. And now here it says atom stable, atom performing at optimal efficiency. Well, that's good news. Um, so I guess this part is probably good to go. 
So I can manually close this part with my hand, or, or I can just click the button here and it'll switch to the next one. But I can always go back to this. And I always can reopen it and reclose it however I choose fit. But going to the next one, because logically from left to right, I go to the next one. It's highlighted here. And looking at the next step of the data pad, it says it has this hexagon with three dots. And no one knows what that means yet. And it says chip one functional, chip two functional, chip three missing. Don't know what that means yet, so. But I do know this hexagon looks a lot like that hexagon, which is also presented on the front of the generator. So when I pull this open, I notice, first, I notice this window back into the, the core that I was working with earlier. But it's also kind of not really in the space where I should reach into it, so it's more of just visible. But behind it, I see this chip here, and one underneath, and I even have freedom to rotate. But there's an empty spot there, and that must be the missing chip. And I see the three dots there, which looks a lot like those three dots. And so I'm thinking to myself, the missing chip is something that belongs there. So when I look around the scene, I see this thing right here. And when I press that, bring chip to mid-generator. Okay, cool. So I found it. When I pick it up, I notice that symbol looks a lot like that. And that three dots look a lot like those. And when I reopen this, I see the same three dots right there, which lets me know I should be able to snap this in place right there. And when I do that, it animates into place and lets me know that it looks like the others, so I probably did something right. When I look over here, the three dots are green and all three read functional. I've finished this area. I can now close the generator. And I can switch to the third part, which looking here, Looking at that icon on this menu, it says routinely inspect the generator shell for optimal peak efficiency. Okay, cool. So I'm going to open that up and I see this spinning work of steel and this um, emissive see-through texture and it's saying update. And what happens when I press one of those? It turns yellow and it ticks down and then it becomes blue, lets me know that I've done my task. And I can go through and do this all the way around. And it would be very easy to tie these variables in a full size game into a, a greater system where you go around and have to update these throughout a level or throughout a game, it keeps track of things that you've updated. But for this, it's just a, a variable where I'm able to control here and I update those and I can close the generator and it stays blue. And if I even peek into the side, you can see the atom core a little bit. And so I've completed all the tasks there. And so I'm gonna continue on here. And well, looking at this uh, list of text here, for uh, those who are less visual thinkers, some people prefer text and it gives you the similar information and it says which part of the generator is open and that changes around and it tells you if it's locked or not. But it also says something called radio off and it's first thought you might think is, hey, I didn't know I had a radio, um, but it says off and I see this strange looking dial here and I see this off button. And so I'm gonna poke it and then I see these waveforms and then I turn it off I turn it back on and it says Strauss 2 which is a uh, music that's playing in the background and then I have three program stations but I can easily make more and now this is the Apollo 11 uh, mission recording and then all the way to the left is another radio station and all of these have different waveforms and I'm going to turn that off for now 
But the reason I included radio is I feel like that is a very um, essential tool for astronauts. Right now, communications is the most important thing between a successful and an unsuccessful mission. And um, not having communications is could be life or death. In my scene, communications is uh, more visual, but I feel like auditory would still exist in the future because it's essential in modern day. Now that we've gone over that, I'm going to show you around the scene a little. As you've seen, there's the generator, but also there's the windows. There's two there, and there's one here, and they look off into space where we have these nebulas and stars, and there's a sun over there and a planet over there that's animating. And in the scene here, you see, uh, you see the, there's a leather wall with a monitor. Uh, there's desks on both sides, uh, lamps, and this uh, hexagon tiled pattern floor, and this door. And when you see this door, you might try to open it and see what's on the other side. And when you press that, it shows you that it's locked. And for the sake of this demo, I've kept it contained to just this one room, but these tools could easily be expanded into, say, a full-size game or at the least an additional room. So this door could be functional and could open if I wanted it to, but there's no reason to because everything I need to show you is right here in this room. And now we're going to go back to my main presentation and I'll explain the systems and how everything works and the reasoning behind a lot of my design process. Thank you for watching this portion of my video. This graphic represents the process I go through when designing a diegetic element for my user interface. I start by finding reference and making a concept as quickly as I can. And then I go into Illustrator, make the vectors. I rasterize them in Photoshop, bring those into Unreal as early as possible. And then I take notes of anything that works, doesn't work, needs to change, and I iterate. And I go all the way back as far as necessary and repeat the process and just constantly iterate the cycle until I have a finished product. In just about every UI element in my project and most other projects, I start with 2D vectors in Adobe Illustrator. And any additional work that needs to be drawn on, I do in Adobe Photoshop. And for any animated element, I use Adobe After Effects, which After Effects is great in that you can bring in Illustrator vector layers and update the Illustrator file, and it will update in After Effects in real time, so you don't have to go back and forth between the two. It's already ready to go. And for actual 3D elements that the user interface is tied to, such as cards and curved surfaces, I model these out in 3ds Max, and I sometimes optimize the faces also in 3ds Max. What you're seeing here is the very first prototype version of my data pad. And there were some pretty obvious flaws here. Notably, the thin lines get completely lost everywhere. The fonts are too small and too hard to read. and there are too many close shades of gray that just get lost together and make it uncomfortable to look at. For the second iteration, I spent a lot of time focusing on technology and not really enough time focusing on the design. And I may have actually taken a few steps back in the UI design aspects. Building a physical frame around the pad seemed like a good idea at the time, but it actually made it less open and it made it harder to touch, especially elements around the corners. Um, a lot of the line work is thicker and more visible than the previous one, but the text is still small and hard to read. And just overall, this is small and cluttered and hard to read because I was thinking that it should be about the size of an iPad because that's what we're used to in real life. But this is virtual reality. Things don't have weight and there's no reason I can't make it larger. So I learned from this. And also the textures here just constantly came out blurry and rendered very slowly and were poorly optimized. And that was my fault for not doing enough research on how to properly do it at this time. So for vertical slice, I 
drastically redesign the entire data pad. Most notably, it is much larger. It has depth and curve in the design. It's no longer flat and boring. And for design, I stripped out anything unnecessary and went minimalist and tried to focus on the important parts. Moving forward into the spring semester milestones, for the data pad, I worked on improving the visuals and the functionality of the of the interface. And I removed some of the non-functional elements and I tried to refine what was important. And I spent a lot of time optimizing and getting everything performing correctly. I added the background animation with the hexagons. It helps improve depth because before it was just a flat blue color, which in stereoscopic space appears blue from any angle. But with these, uh, with a grid on the background, when you move text and icons, you actually see movement. I also added subtle drop shadows to everything to improve clarity and separation. And it helps when you're on certain elements to have a drop shadow to actually be able to read. I improved a lot of the symbolism here and made sure that it made sense in scene. And I spent a lot of time optimizing the performance. Uh, previously, the data pad had an absurd amount of overdraw and elements lagged to where some, pi some parts of the data pad would be several frames behind the main background. And it was very sickening and hard to read. And most people commented on that, including myself. And that was a major priority to fix. Outside of just my data pad, there are several UI elements in the scene that you can interact with. Most of these elements directly affect the information and imagery of the data pad, while others exist around the room to provide helpful information to the player. For a majority of my animated elements, I use flipbooks. And to make these flipbooks, I start in Adobe After Effects by rendering out single PNG frames. And then I use this free piece of software called Gluit to turn all of these frames into one image, also known as a sprite sheet, as can be seen here. The visibility of many elements in my UI are constantly toggled between being visible and invisible. And there are multiple stages of visibility that you should be aware of. It's tempting to only use visible and hidden, but it's important that you research what all five of these mean. Um, the, the main difference between hidden and collapse is a hidden object still receives calculations every frame, while a collapsed object is turned off and no longer computes information. However, sometimes you do want to compute information, such as a health bar, because when you switch it to visible, there will be a frame where when you go from collapse to visibility, it will be non-updated, while hidden is already up to date, so you're not giving false information to the player. Hit test invisible means that the object is completely visible but non interactive. And self hit test invisible means it's visible and non interactive, but generally this is a nested widget and the, the child widget still has visible and clickable functions that are built into it. And visible, the normal setting, means you can see the object and you can use its clickable functions. And now I'd like to get back to virtual reality for a minute. For virtual reality, this is the pipeline I generally follow. It starts with a concept and a research phase, and then I follow tutorials to try to understand these systems that I have not worked with before, and just try to gauge what other people have done to find solutions. And I begin developing my own systems based off of what I've seen others do and based off what the wikis have suggested. And these systems are rarely what they should be on the first attempt. So I got to constantly iterate the process. And then I got to optimize because you can make something be functional. But if it isn't optimized, it's eating up way more frames than it should be. And it may be slowing down your scene in the long run. And so through constant iteration and optimization, eventually you'll reach a finished product. And when starting a virtual reality scene, 
Well, in Unreal Engine, you probably should start with the VR template, which is a good way to go, and it gives you some nice scripts, such as the, the basic grab and the teleportation and the headset movement. But this in itself is not fully optimized, and there's several steps you need to go through to properly make your scene run at a smooth frame rate. One important decision to make early on is whether or not your project's going to be forward rendered or deferred rendered. And the difference between forward rendering and deferred rendering is forward is applying the lighting to the pixels initially, while deferred rendering waits until later passes to calculate all lighting based effects. Forward rendering in most cases is going to be a lot faster and performs better. However, deferred rendering will give you better looks for transparency, reflection, captures, and post-processing effects and any lighting based effects will typically look better in deferred rendering. However, both Epic Games, which are the makers of Unreal Engine, and Oculus, the makers of the Rift S, both suggest forward rendering for virtual reality for the performance sake. In my project, I initially thought deferred rendering would be the better idea since my scene is very reflection heavy, very translucency heavy, and I thought the trade-offs of switching to to forward rendering would not pay off. I was wrong, I'll admit that. Forward rendering has been a lifesaver for me. Just looking at the alpha milestone here versus the beta milestone, the alpha milestone uh, atom was extremely costly and it was uh, overdrawing quite a bit, like you can see the red there, versus the beta is drawing completely green, so I could have many of these atoms in the scene and they wouldn't be affecting the render too much. And as you can see on the generator images on the right, the top one is from the alpha milestone and the bottom one is from the beta milestone. Both still have quite a bit of red, but the uh, the top alpha one through all the different layers of translucency, reflection, emissives, these are very complex uh, machinery and you get a lot of white and purple, which is just very difficult to render in real time. While on the bottom, I'm, I'm working with a lot more greens and uh, darker shades of red, so it's, it's manageable. It could be optimized further if needed, but in my testing, I was still able to get high enough frames to not be lagging, so uh, forward rendering has made my life a lot better, and I highly suggest it for anyone working in virtual reality. When making 3D models for virtual reality, there are certain considerations you need to make that are not typical for a standardized game. Namely, uh, depth is perceived differently in VR. Normal maps don't exactly work as well as they do in traditional game design, and because of this, any noticeable detail should try to be modeled by hand in a mid-poly fashion as opposed to the typical low-poly workflow where you bake high-res details in a normal map. And for mid-poly, you're going to be adding a few tries, well, more than a few. You're going to be adding tries to every object, but you're still going to want to optimize. Um, most of these tries go to the edges and corners, which you're going to want to smooth out and try to get your object down to one smoothing group. And after that, you're probably going to want to uh, adjust the face normals to where the object is correctly shaded. For virtual reality, normal maps do not function correctly. Um, in this graph I've made, the first image on the left is a typical game with a single camera looking at a, a flat face. Uh, you don't perceive depth because there's no model depth and there's no normal maps on that, so there's no depth shown. The second image is a typical single camera game where you're looking at a flat face, but it has normal maps, and they give you the illusion of depth, and as far as visually, you perceive the depth. And the third image is a VR headset looking at the same sort of object as before. Uh, the normal maps, however, don't actually perceive correctly because the normals are a calculation between the camera and the face, and they give an illusion of what where something should be perceived. But when you're working with two cameras, this point is usually between both of them or only on one of them. So 
both cameras are seeing a slightly wrong angle for the object and typically normal maps will look flat from up close in VR and for that reason in this fourth image we are actually modeling out these details because it will be perceived correctly when it's actually there. And for these mid-poly models, I've been using face-weighted normals. Uh, the script I use is called Improved Face-Weighted Normals, which is $5 online. There's a free version, but the improved version is easily worth the cost. But what face-weighted normals does is, if we look at this image here, the first one is just the image taken directly out of Max or Maya with one smoothing group applied. And what face normals are is the direction each face says is outward. And sometimes it gets that information a little bit wrong, but baking a normal map typically corrects most of these flaws and you don't have to worry about the actual face normal unless you're getting really, really bad results. And the standard free face weight normal script does a good job of calculating which directions the face should be However, you get these uh, you get these little pinch lines here on some of these flat faces because some of them they're calculating at like very micro degrees difference, but it's enough to where you perceive uh, a non-flat face when we actually want this whole thing to be flat. Improved face weight normals does a better job of all of these polygons on top recognizing that they're part of the same face and they should face the same direction. And I've actually been using face-weighted normals on my non-VR project because it gives you a cleaner model to bake normal maps to. It can still solve problems because I've had issues in the past where you can see these creases even on an object after applying normals to it. And uh, face-weighted normals, it's a one-button solution that provides just so much headache relief. Another thing for virtual reality is you want to test it in an actual EXE format. And a lot of us here had never actually packaged a game before. And while it's probably a good idea to package any game to test it, because it may run perfectly in engine, everything may look right, but when you run your game, some things might be wrong. And for VR especially, there are issues that are only noticed in the final package build that were not present in engine. And so these are, these images just show a couple of steps to make sure that you package correctly. Um, you wanna make sure it's start in VR's toggled and you wanna make sure that in the begin play on the, on the level script that you have enable HMD, which head mounted display. And uh, I also have and this one's optional, but I like to make a command to go full screen. That way, when you're demoing in VR, your demo goes full screen for the people watching. Um, other things about packaging the project, you want to make sure that, well, it'll give you a log of any issues. Um, Non-critical issues will be yellow. These are ones that you would like to fix if you have time. But then the red issues are issues that you absolutely have to address or you cannot package this project. I only had a couple red issues, luckily, and most of them were quick fixes. But even just trying to package it is a good way of optimizing and finding errors in your project and fixing things to the correct form. For interactables, I follow this sort of uh, method. I like to concept things out, try to draw things out on paper, or at least think about them for a while. I research similar projects that other people did and similar systems. And then I try to get to prototyping fairly early on and just try to consult the tutorials and wikis and forums and try to s solve the problems out on my own as I can, but then also learn from what others have done and mostly their mistakes. For these uh, interactables, it's important to get a uh, a quick proxy model. Uh, for the proxies, you want to get things that are relatively the size of the final object you want, because a lot of the interactive systems are dependent on collision and shape. And so you get these into Unreal. You need to make note of what works and doesn't work. And again, you need to uh, constantly iterate your process, test it. 
iterate, test, and just continue as many times as possible. For my main interactable object, it's my uh, generator mechanism. And uh, the generator handle function at first worked completely incorrectly in VR, and I had to come up with my own solution of relative location to be able to have it stay in the correct place and create limits of where it could and could not be. In my system, as pictured in this blueprint, uh, the objects reference the location of each other, and they also reference the location of the player's hand. Um, this lets each other know if they've gone too far or where they're allowed to go. There are other ways of uh, solving this solution. Um, if I could go back, I probably would have used a spline-based constraint, but this sort of relative constraint does a good job of knowing where it should be. The only problem is you have an object referencing an object, referencing an object, referencing an object sometimes, which could possibly create lag. Um, for other interactable systems I had to come up with is I needed objects to snap into place correctly. And for this, I came up with a creative solution to where the object, once it's in place, and the object that you actually grab with your hand are actually separate instances where for this chip in the image, the chip is always there. Just sometimes it's not visible until the... Uh, the one you can pick up, when it hits that collision box right here, it dis it the one in your hand is destroyed, and the one here is visible. The reason I do that is to ensure that one, it's always in place where it should be, and two, this instance of it doesn't have the scripts that it doesn't need. It doesn't. Uh, you can't pull it out. It doesn't constantly try to calculate where it is at times. It's actually part of this machine and it's a uh, cost saving and it provides a uh, consistency to where 100% of the time I know this will appear in the correct place and not just go off somewhere it shouldn't be. The atom in the core uses a similar snapping system. When setting up systems for your scene, a very important thing is to consider the game mode blueprint. And a game mode blueprint can be used as a repository to store multiple variables that are being called by separate blueprint instances. Um, one situation that I have is uh, I have several scripts that need to know what part of the generator is open and when it's open. And so I used to try to reference each other and send variables to each object checking variables of other objects, seeing, is this open? Is this closed? How long has it been open? Where is it going to next? And it was a mess. And I realized I can make a single variable in game mode that my other blueprints all reference. And this way, when one of these is enabled, every single script sees it at the same time and updates in real time. And casting off a uh, game mode is fairly simple. You just, in your begin play, the easiest way is to cast a reference and then promote this to a variable. And you can, from this game mode reference, you can call any stored variable. And here's an example of several of mine. Something I noticed for my UI scripts and my interactable scripts is that they were becoming very reliant on event tick, which was becoming costly. And what event tick is, is it is an event that calls an update every single rendered frame of the game, which in virtual reality is 80 times a second, which can be very costly, especially for like th things that aren't as important. I don't need to know what radio station I'm on 80 times a second. I may need to do other things like rotation and like critical calculations, but most of my scripts I can get away with I don't know, 10 times a second, or sometimes even less than that. And one way of doing this that I liked was the timer events. And the way I set this up is off of the begin play script, I do a start timer event where when you set a timer, you can set it to looping. 
And over here in the time, that's how often it updates. So in this particular instance, I'll be calling this event update every half a second. So that's two times a second versus 80 times a second. That's 40 times more efficient. And it will save calculations when you do this to many of your scripts. For my artifact, I initially was influenced by existing space stations like the ISS. And then I also looked at art station to see what kind of uh, modules other people have designed. Um, I tried not to stick too long into what other people have made, but I wanted to just quickly get an idea. And at first in pre-production, I just tried to block out the shape. I knew I kind of wanted it to be wider on the sides than it was on top, just to give you more arm room. But this is a pretty bare bones empty scene here. For a vertical slice, I thought that spaceships would be mostly aluminum and glass. And so I just have a lot of these aluminum, shiny metal walls and glass, and it's a little bare. So going forward into alpha, I decided that I needed a redesign to make mine more exciting. And I was inspired by the game Prey, where they had the Neo Deco design. And what Neo Deco is, is a combination between Art Deco design and the 1960s space race between the USA and Soviet Russia. And in Prey, it also takes place on a future space vessel. And so I was able to draw a lot of influence from them here. Some of what I took from Neo Deco design is that it should use organic earthly elements like woods and leather to cover surfaces. Think like a luxury car where you're gonna have leather seats and possibly wood trim on the dash. That does not make the car perform any better whatsoever. However, it makes the driver feel more at ease and it makes them happier. In space travel, you're not gonna see trees for possibly months or years at a time. So I think wood would be quite a luxury that people would want on board. Um, I also think that underneath the surfaces, everything is steel. The steel is still what's functional and things like machinery, you're not going to coat that as much. That's going to be exactly what it is. And then for trim, I think gold grass does a good job. And in art deco movement, you'd see geometric patterns of grass everywhere. And I think that translates well to Neo Deco. For functional future elements, I was thinking more on the lines of aluminum, glass, and a mist of textures. I was thinking kind of like Apple and iPads and cell phones. Everything's made of aluminum and glass these days, and everything's bright and glowing. And I imagine in our spaceships, things will be a similar way. Aluminum is a very structural sound object, and Glass is very appealing and emissives can help display and provide direction. This is a rendering from the beta version of my artifact. And after I applied high quality reflections and readjusted the lighting after switching to forward renderer, I think this might actually look better than my alpha when it was using deferred renderer. It's all about being able to tweak the materials and lighting appropriately and this scene runs significantly faster. But other than that, as far as the scene goes, I tried to keep all the materials and objects the same as before. The only major change here is that I redid the skybox. And for that, I used a piece of software called Spacescape, which can be found for free on the internet. And what Spacescape is good for is it can make these procedural generated skies, and you have control of the number of stars and you can start adding nebulas and start changing the colors and on the right is the cube map that i ended up coming up with and bringing into unreal engine what went well the ui is fairly legible throughout the entire scene it performs very well in virtual reality almost always staying close to 80 frames a second and i didn't have to cut visual quality to get there all of the systems work and they communicate well with each other in real time. And I think I came up with a unique and interesting sense of style for the scene, the UI, and just the way things are shaped and look. What went wrong? 
there was overscope in pretty much every pillar of mastery and the artifact itself. I initially started the project with desires to add a whole bunch of things that weren't needed. And I kept wanting to make redundant features that didn't add anything that wasn't already being shown by a different object. Overdraw was a major issue, uh, especially after vertical slice. I wanted to get everything in there and I wanted to make everything look good, but I didn't spend enough time to properly optimize and research how things should be until later. I got too much tunnel vision on some small aspects when I didn't see the bigger picture and what needed to be done. So it's too easy to focus on little details or one system when I need to work on eight systems. And I fairly drastically redesigned my looks pretty often. The data pad looks completely different in several instances. The room itself, while the shape itself didn't really change much, the textures and the look of things did completely. Um, and one more what went wrong is I had broken an inefficient code during large chunks of the dev cycle. Some systems I got working correctly pretty early on. Some things I just pushed off because I didn't know the solution early or I stuck with a solution that technically worked, but it wasn't efficient. And I should have done more research at the beginning to get that right. Even better ifs, plan better. I prioritize some things that shouldn't have been priority and other things I didn't even consider that were critical details. Uh, always testing more could have uh, helped prevent a lot of heartache and could have kept me from doing lots of long hours that were would have been unnecessary otherwise had I known better. Uh, research more, especially in the case of VR optimizations. I thought I researched enough, but it turns out some of these things I did later made huge differences that I didn't even consider from early on. And then kill your babies. Make cuts early, make cuts often, refine things down to essentials. Don't have redundant features. Just try to stick with what's essential to your project. And it took me too long to do that. And it'd be even better if I took more time to learn proper scripting and spend more time with interactive workflow and possibly unrelated thesis projects, just go through tutorials instead of just going at some of these systems blindly. How this could help future cohorts? They will know some effective methods and pipelines for developing a user interface, and hopefully they've picked up a few tricks for making a good diegetic user interface and how to make a UI for VR and mostly how not to make a UI for VR. I've picked up several VR tricks that I would have loved to have known about when I began the project in both sense of uh, scripting, modeling, UI design, everything. Uh, in hindsight, I could have saved myself so many hours. Tips for anyone interested in tech art for Unreal Engine. I've uh, solved a lot of problems that I'd never addressed before, and there's a good chance that the next cohort hasn't addressed either. And hopefully they can learn from my mistakes. I think I solved most of my problems, but it, it'd be better if I could have avoided them in the first place. And if they read my documentation, hopefully they do avoid them. If I had six more months to improve this project, I would definitely want to add additional pages and functionality to the datapad menu. Right now, it's just that one page, but I imagine in a real game, there would be some option menus and accessibility options, uh, additional rooms that serve a different purpose. Right now, this is just one room with mainly one giant interactive object. It'd be great to see what other parts of this uh, vessel look like and I could come up with different systems that require different things to do. And uh, I could further show what the style is capable of beyond just this uh, one red room with wood. I would like to come up with different interactive systems too. Um, the generator is nice and I love the generator, but there's so much more in VR that I'd like to try that I've seen other games doing lately. Um, modeling and texturing hands. Those are the one thing in the scene that I don't take credit for, I did not make the Unreal hands. And I, for a while I considered making my own hands, but 
modeling and texturing and rigging hands is its own mastery. And I didn't have time for that. That wasn't a priority for me. So I stuck with the unreal hands. And then scripting to limit hands and head from going through walls and floor. It's uh, not as easy as it sounds in VR. Most games to this point don't actually limit where your hands and head can go. So I can end any project that actually stops you from going through a wall. And then just some scripts could have been improved. Um, I think the generator, I, I could have uh, created spline driven constraints that would have been more efficient than my uh, current reference system. And then just better optimization. I, I could definitely optimize more in six months. And thank you for watching. That is my thesis. Please uh, look at my documentation and my website for further details that I may have not mentioned here. Thank you.